All right, so I think we're ready to go into the second half of our evening, and this is going to be a panel and interactive discussion. We have Brent Green. Brent, there you go. Um, is an author, speaker, trainer, and consultant focused on leading edge baby boomers. And we have Jeffrey Sampson, founded Sampson Design, a product design and development firm. Will McCarthy is obviously in the middle, an engineer, novelist, journalist, and entrepreneur. I want to start out with the question of, you just saw Tom's 12 key points about the future. Which one, maybe starting left to right, which one just most struck you, and which one do you disagree with, and why? Actually, what, what impressed me the most, or what really keyed me on something this uh, evening, is that the, our economy is a very established or a structured thing. We think of it as an element of security in our lives and being dependent on the stock market and the American currency, for example, that most of the world pays very close attention to. And essentially what we said tonight is it's, it's almost out the door. It's not so much about us individually as it is about what we as a whole are going to do in all this moving towards the future to create the same kind of comfort and stability while we're changing at an even greater pace, the pace that Tom addressed. So that's what hit me this evening. And I'd like to talk a lot more about it and talk with the audience about it, but let me pass this on. OK, great. Well, the three, uh, uh, I, I, I agree. I'm not going to disagree with Tom, but uh, there, there were three deficiencies, I thought, in the, uh, in the talk as presented. Uh, there was uh, very little discussion about energy there was very little discussion about agriculture. You could 3D print the food, but where does the food actually come from? How was it originated? Uh, and then finally, real estate. Uh, as the uh, way that we work and the way that we live changes so much, uh, we still need some location on the ground to, to call our home. And maybe, maybe we can occupy the deserts. Maybe the cost of real estate will plummet as more regions of the earth become accessible. Or maybe the opposite will happen maybe we'll be even more concentrated in cities. Um, but I thought that that was a piece of the discussion that was, that was glaringly missing and that I expect to see at the, at the next talk. Um, <laughs> one thing that I especially agreed with uh, is the idea that jobs are going to be uh, destroyed and created at an ever-increasing rate. And while you declined to read the, the biographies of, of uh, those of us up here, I think that we're all examples of that. I think that part of the reason you get to be sort of a futurist and a generalist is because you've been forced to shift gears in your own career multiple times. Uh, you know, I was a science fiction writer, and changes in the publishing industry drove me to uh, believe that I had greater economic advantage in starting a technology business. I actually invented a smart window film that tips when it gets hot. That was a direct uh, result of some work that I had been doing in science fiction. Uh, and uh, ended up raising money, starting a company. I put everything I had into that for 10 years. And then I got booted by my own board of directors. That's the future catching up with me yet again. And uh, so I think, uh, and I'm sure that this kind of experience is, is not limited to, to those of us uh, up here. but everyone in the audience uh, is increasingly having that same experience of just needing to be very, very nimble, needing to be able to jump uh, into something new very quickly, come up to speed on something new very quickly. That's going to be a key attribute of the 21st century, and we'd better all get used to it. OK, <clears throat> since the beginning of time, 100 billion people have been born and died on this planet. We now have seven billion souls, so that's 107 billion. Of all the people who have ever reached the age of 65, half of them are alive today. We are seeing a longevity revolution, the likes of which has never happened in our entire history. 70% of all the wealth in the United States is held by people over the age of 50. So part of what I heard in Tom's presentation is a lot about what, what's coming, 
how it's going to be coming, but what I didn't hear is why, to a large extent. I mean, it's something cool we can do, and of course we're going to want to print our own T-bone steaks when that opportunity presents itself. But we cannot forget the human factor. I am a social constructionist. I believe that we create our social reality. So when we have a vastly aging population and technologies evolving on a parallel track, the consequences start informing what are the, which of these technologies are going to be predominant and how are they going to apply. So I, this is being filmed or was being filmed by a Korean network. So I pulled up something about aging in South Korea. And it's, the opening paragraph on CNBC is South Korea has one of Asia's fastest growing economies, but one looming roadblock threatens to its path to becoming an international powerhouse, a rapidly aging population. Now that's the narrative. That's the narrative that gets played out daily in our own media. The uh, kind of unspoken, oftentimes directly addressed fact that aging is a negative thing. So that's what I dwell on in my writing and thinking. We are going to see things change because of psychological motivation. So what's going to motivate a lot of this health technology that Tom was talking about? I'll tell you in three words. Compression of morbidity. What does that mean? Live long, die short. In other words, I'm sure we probably all would hold true to the idea that it would be great to live a long and robust and vital life and then die fast. Well, that's going to set up a lot of industries. It's going to focus a lot of what's going to happen. Where Tom did tie it back, as an example, were the driverless cars. When you have an aging population that wants to still maintain its active vitality on, in transportation, then obviously the driverless cars are going to have a strong market. A lot of that market will be people over the age of 50. So that's my shape of things, my filter on things. And then the other thing I will add is that technology is going to rule in almost every industry out there, but what is also going to rule are pushbacks. In other words, our desire to find the peaceful places, the being spaces, the way to uh, connect with more fundal, fundamental spiritual issues that cannot be quantified or technified and that is going to be driving our motivations as well. And as we age as a population, those motivations universally rise up as people age and as a population ages. Okay, so it does strike me that there's sort of a, a, you know, a piece where we can get these together because die quickly, produce biomatter, use 3D food printers. We got soil and green. <laughs> so. That's my prediction. And really, I'm not interested in eating any at this point. Um, but I want to talk about something different because there's, there's all sorts of things, as always, um, bubbling around around the globe. And one of the things that I'm trying to understand and I'd be interested in your opinions on is the future of law enforcement, the future of creating a safer, more peaceful society. And I think that we right now in this country have all sorts of stuff going on that seems to be moving us in the opposite direction. So again, maybe starting with you, Will, since you have the mic, um, what does that look like in 10, 20, 50 years? Uh, I'm actually pretty pessimistic when it comes to the future of law enforcement. Um, not only uh, criminal enforcement of the law, but also civil enforcement of the law is driving us toward this uh, nanny state and toward this kind of nerf world where everything has the safety on all the time and it's very difficult to access the real world. It's very difficult to access the operating system. You can't change the battery in your, in your iPad, for example. I mean, there are so many things that we're not allowed to do. We're going to avoid the warranty. We're going to uh, uh, garner civil penalties. We're going to garner criminal penalties for doing anything other than staying in the lane that, that has been uh, laid out for us. And yeah, and, and if anyone has children, this really comes to play in playgrounds. So you go and look at a playground that's been designed in the last year or two, and there's nothing for the kids to play on anymore. And there's these like rubberized floor surfaces, and that's about it. There's no swings, there's no seesaws, there's no merry-go-rounds, there's no climbing gyms, they're all gone. 
the, I find that concept very disturbing because uh, the way that we got all this stuff was by growing up in a chaotic and, and vaguely threatening environment and having to become strong and, and thoughtful people. Uh, if you grow up in a world where everything is nerf, I think you grow up to be a, a kind of idiot. <laughs> Those young people in the audience might want to. <laughs> Actually, um, we're working on a project right now um, that's a little unusual in the sense, well, first of all, let me start out with 80% of all shopping m malls and retail centers will be gone in the next five years. Five years. Uh, part of the study that we've undertaken is that mothers and grandmothers want to take their children to shopping malls but that the child actually rules the situation in today's world. If the child starts to cry or is irritable, she immediately leaves. She only stays there for about an hour, as long as the child is happy, and she buys approximately two purchases, and she goes home and purchases the rest over the internet. Now, there's two things that are coming out of that. Our entire retail existence is changing. But more importantly than that is that a child under the age of five years old is determined, actually determining the parent's lifestyle, the decisions they make, and how, they, how long they stay somewhere. And that's because children have suddenly become even more valuable than they ever have been in the past. Children used to be thought of not as disposable, but a miracle if they lived, so you had a lot of children. Today, they're the emperors and the empresses. You referred to them as a nerf generation, which is not incorrect. We have protected them so much that there's a big question of whether they'll be able to support themselves, let alone our generation as we get older. Gee, that's kind of out of my wheelhouse, but <clears throat> to your question, I want to add one point that I uh, neglected to mention in, in my comments earlier, since this is focused on the future of jobs. Uh, one industry that's kind of a pushback to techni technical everything <coughs> is the experience industry. And we've seen a tremendous growth in, in worldwide tourism, and it's going to continue. And yes, there will always be an overlay of technology but it's kind of the high touch to the high tech that people will be seeking uh, to balance their lives that is completely dominated by technology, technology, technology. Uh, to the area of crime, two stories, uh, true story. Yesterday, no, actually, today. Uh, I live in a neighborhood, gated community, skews older than 50, generally just because of the nature of the neighborhood. Uh, somebody. Somebody's house was broken into, and they had the laptop stolen, jewelry, passports, and so forth. What the thief neglected to understand is they also had a FOSS cam in their house. The FOSS cam not only took HD video of them, emailed and Twittered the, the owner of the house that the house is being broke into, but the owner of the house was able to say, hey, asshole, get out of here, uh, through the FOSS cam from where he was in Mexico. So the future of law enforcement is certainly going to be driven by technology, and a lot of it's going to be focused on managing the problem of an aging society, more and more likely to be the subject of crime because of accumulation of assets and wealth, and also because of financial crime. So we're, you know, technology is going to drive that, and it's also going to support the process. We, that is my neighborhood, were able to turn over everything that the police would need to do for their investigation with no investment in time. Right. Well, it's interesting that the example you gave because what I hear is that they didn't call the police. They took matters into their own hand remotely. Now, I'm sure they actually probably did call the police. Um, but there's also this sort of rise of, of, if you will, informal vigilantism. And I think that leads into my next question. 
which is if you look at what's going on in Ferguson, one of the really interesting things about the reporting is it's now a very standard part of reports to say, well, and they have a Facebook group that has 160,000 likes. And there's actually, it's not a Kickstarter, I think it's an Indiegogo campaign for the legal fund for the police officer that shot that boy. And so I think that what we're seeing is that, you know, the whole Kickstarter, the whole concept of crowdfunding has, is now becoming somewhat like crowd voting. And I wonder its implications on our political system because, you know, we have this whole sort of representational democracy, ostensibly, where we don't actually vote for the president, we vote for people who then vote what they feel is the most appropriate, right? That's obsolete. I mean, Tom mentioned that in, in his talk, but I just see that very immediately now is, you know, the journalists, the people that are forming our opinions are actually taking, you know, really strongly into account the popular voice in a way that's never happened before. And so I wonder what you guys think about that and its implications on democracy and the future of politics. Well, that, that in essence is democracy in a strange sense. It's just not everybody agreeing. So as we, we talked about last night a little bit, the, the whole concept of nationalism is tribal. Mm -hmm. You brought that up, in fact, Dave. Um, that is to say that we're made up of small groups and small cultures, and they may not all be the same all the time. They sort of move in and out. What, what we're talking about tonight, you'll be sharing or discussing with somebody else tomorrow, and that culture will have a certain movement to it, which is very um, temporal, uh, temporary in context. Um, along that line, though, and back to what we were talking about before, and I don't want to totally avoid this, the, the elections may only become important when the organizations that make up the culture, the total culture, um, cease to be effective, which gets back to how do you control them and what do you do to stimulate them or to basically uh, enact some sort of security. We have just completed a project in our organization that designed radio systems that are going to be on all the top um, cell towers in Colorado. Those radio systems are designed for one thing, and that's to control drones. And those, the, the, the reason that our state government accepted it was under the context that the agriculture on the front plains needs it to survey their crops and manage their crop lands. However, the reality is there is more capability for the security whether it be national, state, or municipal, to use those drones than agriculture. Um, those implications are huge. Uh, and basically what Tom showed on here were the drones going out to save people, that's very true. The drones going out to take care of fire situations, that's very true. But it does come back to who's in control. And at what point how do we define freedom? Um, it was interesting today when, when Tom brought up essentially, how did you put it? Uh, it had to do with um, being forgotten. Even when we're forgotten, we're going to be observable. <laughs> yep. And I want to point out that some of that technology has been around for years. So one yes. of the things that law enforcement does in, in rough neighborhoods is they have microphones in multiple locations and they can triangulate in under a second to identify the exact location of a gunshot. So they can dispatch police officers to that location immediately without waiting for it to be called in. So, I mean, some of that stuff's already out there. Yeah. Well, and treading into potentially uh, 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 controversial territory. Go there. controversy. Come on, Will. Uh, <laughs> the, what's, the, the stuff that's happening uh, in, in, in uh, Ferguson right now is, is being mislabeled as a, as a race issue when, in fact, it's uh, really an economic issue. I mean, a lot of conflicts really are economic at, at their heart. Not all, but, but most uh, have, have economics at their, at their heart. Mm -hmm. What we see with increasing globalization, increasing automation, is that 
Uh, knowledge workers have to be increasingly nimble. If you're not a knowledge worker, though, you're increasingly uh, uh, disenfranchised altogether. And so while 50 years ago you could get a job digging ditches if you weren't suitable for any other work, uh, today there are no jobs digging ditches. You simply can't get that job. You can get a job operating a machine that digs lots and lots of ditches really fast, but there aren't very many of those kinds of jobs, and those tend to go to knowledge workers as well. And so we end up in this uh, uh, kind of uh, player piano situation like Kurt Vonnegut outlined long ago, where uh, there's good work for an increasingly uh, smaller fraction or a, a, a decreasing fraction of, of civilization. And the question then is what happens to the dis disenfranchised? And there are really three different answers. You can either leave them disenfranchised to fend for themselves in a world that has no place for them, which is bad. You can socialize, in which case you're kind of doling out the goodies to the people who are good. And I think that that's kind of bad as well. Uh, and then the other thing is just to find uh, you know, new, new frontiers where, where everyone's needed and everyone's wanted and everyone has a place. And I think that we can do that, but I think at this particular moment in time, we haven't done it. And the kinds of problems that result from not doing it are only going to get worse. Hmm. Yeah, to that, that point, essentially, a, a number of years ago, there was, we started, of course, with the agricultural uh, industry move to the industrial uh, ization that we all are very familiar with and theoretically moved into the uh, intelligence uh, intellectual industry. In reality what we're in is the entertainment industry. We are essentially, particularly here in America, uh, even the cell phones we carry in our pocket have more data relative to entertainment that they actually do to performing uh, specific functions that uh, you know, allow us to shovel that ditch or do something along that line. Uh, and <coughs> what is in there is, is uh, essentially based on what you're talking about, the, the intellectual aspect, not the physical aspect of, of accomplishing tasks. So as a culture, we're basically on the riff of a new, a whole new culture. And as we talked about last night, what was it, every four years we turn over cultures? essentially in whole new directions. We don't know what the next one is. I don't know that anybody does. And it could hold, uh, it'd be based on a lot of the disenfranchised population if they get sick of being entertained. If they get tired of listening to music, watching television, going to the movies, watching YouTube, what do they do next? Is that enough? Is that going to satisfy them? Now the interesting aspect is even our education world is moving into entertainment. The child I was talking about a little while ago that's five years old, it's desirable for the parent to teach them through entertainment, more desirable than it is to teach them through force or demanding that they spend a specific amount of time with something. It's through entertainment. I'm not sure that's bad, but the implications are very interesting. All right, so you're still, you're still on the hook for the, my question about the future of law enforcement and crowdsourcing and Okay, first all of, of all, I want to hitchhike a bit here on what you were just saying. <laughs> Some would argue that we are, we've moved beyond the entertainment industry. We're moving into the transformation industry. In other words, what people are going to be seeking are ways of transforming themselves through the experiences that we're having. And that's a higher level of psychological evolution uh, than perhaps just being entertained, which can be seen as a passage. Yeah, it's going beyond experiences to actual transformation. So, saying that, uh, all of you are aware of the uh, recession of 2008, and probably some of you were impacted by it in this room. Well, so was Iceland. Uh, they were taken out heavily because their, their concentrated leadership, con uh, leadership concentrated among a few people, invested a lot in the uh, areas that crashed because of the recession of 2008. So what they've done now is crowdsource their next constitution. Now they can conveniently do that because they're on an island and there's, you know, 150,000 people, 
but with the technologies. I think Tom had a quote up there that was in effect, uh, we create our technologies and technologies create, create us. Uh, so we have a capability of getting a different type of representation. Uh, many of you remember Bernie Madoff, and I gave a speech in Boston in May, and one of the other speakers I had a good fortune of sitting next to, his name is, um, uh, his first name's Harry. I had his name a second ago, but anyway, um, he was the gentleman that busted uh, Bernie Madoff. Uh, he noticed in five minutes that Bernie Madoff was, was swindling everybody, including the banks. But it took him nine years to convince uh, the oversight agencies to do something about it. He is going to be creating an amendment to the Constitution that will probably appear to you one of these days. Uh, he's very confident that he can do it. And when you meet this guy, you, you get why he... You know, you kind of tend to be a believer in his capabilities. Uh, but anyway, he is going to look at, there will only be six-year terms for all congressional representatives, House of Representatives, U.S. Senate, U.S. President. There will be a six-year period where people that have served in national political offices cannot return as lobbyists. Um, and so... You're going, to actually, you're going to make them actually work? <laughs> <laughs> so suddenly the dynamics of our political system could completely change with that kind of amendment. Um, and that, in effect, was driven by the technological collapse of our financial systems. And uh, first of all, putting too much faith in too few people and then the financial systems behind that buying those beliefs which in this case was Bernie Madoff. Right. Okay, so, so the next thing I want to talk about, and then I'm going to open it up for questions, is I want to talk about privacy. And where privacy has come up is that um, I write a lot about technology. I write for the Boulder Daily Camera and stuff. And I've been getting a series of questions over the last couple of weeks about Facebook Messenger on the iPhone. So how many people have Facebook and they use it on their iPhones or smartphones? And how many people installed Messenger because you had to? Um, so when you read all the small print on Messenger and you look at all of its settings and configuration, it seems to be a very threatening app. Now, I don't think it is a particularly threatening app, but I keep getting questions from people about, oh my gosh, should I even run this? Should I like quit Facebook? And the thing is, is that I appreciate their fear because I think that this, we're, we're coming into an era where we either have to give up our privacy or we have to more and more gird ourselves to fight to retain it. And I think that this is a snowball and um, I think it's uh, Bill Joy who said years ago, privacy is dead, get over it. And I think that he was very prescient and I think that's where we are now. And so the first question I have is to everyone is, how many of you feel like we've already crossed the threshold and you're already losing privacy faster than you can actually try to hold on to it? Okay, now I'm going to swing it to you guys. What does that mean and what does that look like down the road? I'm just going to finish my thought and say Harry Markopoulos is the name I was trying to Oh, okay. Him. Harry Markopoulos. And look him up. He's a hero because he was the one that saw what Bernie was doing and was able to get him busted after nine years of persistence. Uh, but I'm going to let one of these other guys start with the question. Uh, I... You know, you and I were talking uh, earlier, and I think that, that uh, we're in agreement that privacy is dead for those people that want to fully participate in all the toys of, of modern society. It actually died a long time ago. We just weren't aware of the, of the moment of its death <laughs> until uh, some time after it happened. I do think, though, uh, you know, if you remember the old Max Headroom TV show, there were a lot of people running around who, whose name was blank so-and-so. So Hi, I'm blank Reg. I'm blank Dave. I'm blank Mark. Uh, and that was a, a movement that had real teeth. Those were people who didn't own computers, didn't use computers, uh, didn't uh, leave any, any trail of anything that they had done. And there was a whole underground economy that took place only among the blanks. Uh, and, you know, the Amish arguably have that, that same kind of vibe. And so you'll see, you'll see a rise in the Amish and the blanks and the people who insist on the right to be forgotten. Uh, 
not so much pushing back against the infrastructure as opting out. I don't think that pushing back is going to be very productive. I think you can waste a lot of energy doing that. I think you can opt out. You can create a dark net. You can, there are a lot of things that you can do, uh, but they will mark you, I believe, as a criminal. Uh, right, so what happens is don't they end up being themselves a disenfranchised community? In, they, they're enfranchised on their own terms. They're, they're absolutely disenfranchised from the, the larger society as a whole. The question is, do they have a viable society of their own in the way that, for example, the Amish do? The other point that I want to uh, uh, resurface here that, that didn't get mentioned with all the 3D printing uh, is the fact that it's now quite uh, feasible to 3D print weapons. And so here, I mean, real weapons that, that not, not run off zip guns, but, but weapons that can fire 100 shots accurately. Uh, and this happened very quickly, and it happened because there was tremendous demand for it by people who felt that their, their privacy and other, other rights were under immediate threat. And so right now you can buy, for a few thousand dollars, you can buy everything that you need to to go into your own uh, uh, gunsmithing business, to produce your own guns. Here in the United States, we have the Second Amendment, which kind of sort of guarantees the right to keep weapons that are enough formidable enough that the police are afraid of you, that the authorities have to think twice before busting down your door. Uh, most of the rest of the world doesn't have any guarantees like that, but they're about to. And so the disenfranchised, if they're not well treated in one way or another, are going to respond with large amounts of 3D printed weaponry. Uh, and that's just a, that's a, that's an unfortunate fact. Actually, the, the in between the Amish and the those that don't mind giving up their privacy, let's put it that way, um, exist the shadow economy. Uh, the shadow economy exists all over the world. I don't know how many of you are aware of it. For example, in the United States, the the concern about the giving up your privacy started with credit cards. Um, people were afraid that you could be traced based on your credit cards, and that's pretty accurate. There's a lot of easy tracking there. So you have the cash economy, and it's those people that pay cash for everything. And they're among us, uh, it, particularly if you visit uh, more rural sections of the United States. Um, the cash economy, I think, is credited with, I could be wrong here, somebody may know, approximately 60% of all tra transactions that take place in the United States today. Um, when Italy, Spain, and during the economic problems that we've just gone through for Europe, and they're sort of slipping back into them again, the cash, or the um, shadow economy amounted to over 80% of each of those countries. Now what that really means is the government's not in control of those. The government isn't benefiting from taxation on most of those. So what you have is a total separate middle income segment of the population surviving on its own quite a ways out of control of the government. And that group is not so upset, but they do have the capability of mustering together and being the militia that could create a revolution or whatever actually more than the disenfranchised at the very bottom. If you'll notice, even though the disenfranchised in Missouri have been allowed to riot, who's got the weapons? It's not that disenfranchised segment that's going to muster. It would be the middle segment, which currently is the shadow economy, that holds its own value for privacy. My head just exploded. Okay, so we're talking death of privacy. I got that. Okay. Um, all I can say is that um, I believe that you can lead an entire, entirely private life and be totally public at the same time. You just have to be smarter. Do you think that's going to become increasingly difficult to accomplish? I... When you think about things like... Um, wide-scale video surveillance with facial recognition, where they identify potential troublemakers walking into a stadium, things like that? Ob obviously, the technological play is going to be huge, but let me finish my point and I'll get it back. 
<laughs> and that point is, is that we still have to deal with the under, underlying psychology and sociology of populations of people. Speaking for the 50 plus generation, we grew up looking at big blue as the man, okay? So there is an, uh, there's a deep psychological mindset that many of us carry, which is a great suspicion of privacy, uh, lo loss of privacy and ability to keep it. Um, as a result of that, I think that's led to more vigilance. I, I, think, I think that political leaders that sidestep communication, forthright communication with their constituents are going to be caught damn fast and damn boldly by the same technology that can steal our privacy. So there is a pushback there because part of um, having privacy is control over your own lives. That's part of the perception of privacy. So if you have the same power that the other guys do, in other words, you can set up video cameras on the people that are watching you. The deal is that, you know, the chessboard starts evening out. Uh, we're not going to lose the technological gains that have been made, but there is a powerful group of uh, constituents within our population that will do everything possible to avoid erosion of their privacy. Right, and I'll bring up the reference to the Watchmen graphic novel which was all about who's watching the people that are watching your society, so. Well, and David Brin wrote a, an excellent book uh, called The Transparent Society, which anyone who's concerned about this issue should read. Uh, basically, uh, the, the premise of the book, and it was written over 10 years ago now, he said, privacy is dead, get over it. The question is, uh, is the privacy of the people who are depriving you of your privacy also dead or not? Will they jealously guard their privacy, the way the NSA is jealously guarding its privacy, or is it impossible for them as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, there, there's some interesting, first of all, statistics. Uh, if you take the sheer amount of every second of your day, if, if somebody's aware of it, who's going to be aware of it and who cares? The amount of data required to know everything you're doing and what you're doing individually and the sea of people that are out there is going to have to be run through computers, okay? It's only the computers that can keep up with that data. They're not there quite yet. Mm. They will be. Oh, there's some. There's no That's a solvable there, problem. But they can't track every second of your day, and they won't know exactly what it is. They can't track every second of everyone's day. They can track every second of somebody's day. <coughs> That's true. That's yeah. true. To put this into perspective, back into Tom's world, between z uh, year zero, whatever that is back in human history, and 2003, the human race created five exabytes of data. Since we've been here tonight, the human race has created about 50 exabytes of data. Now, do we have 10x the value? Let's, we're not going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> in other words, five exabytes of data every 10 minutes. Yeah. So the point is, is and we, have, uh, we, we will have laptop computers costing the equivalent of today's $1,000 that can think as fast as the human brain by 2030. By 2050, a laptop costing uh, equivalent of $1,000 will be able to think as fast as the entire human race. Can you remind us what an exabyte is again? A lot of data. Tom can probably. And I just want to point out that a computer that can think as fast as the entire human race will still run Microsoft Word slowly. <laughs> but it'll be way more sophisticated back at that point. So, so I want to open it up for questions and comments. So um, we don't have a mic at this point, so I'll repeat your questions. So don't, please don't spend five minutes pontificating because then I'm stuck having to figure out what to say. So short, succinct, interesting questions spoke loudly, please. Okay, so the observation is that for this young woman, um, as a 27-year-old self-attested geek, right, um, is that her childhood was anything but nerf, and that she was constantly breaking things and breaking into things, right? Exactly. And NSA, we're not talking about that kind of stuff, so don't pay attention to this comment. So, <laughs> what do you, so, so, so what I believe is happening is I believe you're misunderstanding their use of the phrase nerf generation. And where I'm gonna suggest that your definition, and you guys can correct me if you're wrong, but I have three children of my own, 
And the safety net around their childhood is so much greater than it ever has been historically. And so my kids, you know, a cop will pull them over if they don't have a bike helmet on. And, you know, they can't do things. We played lawn darts as kids. You can't even buy lawn darts because God forbid someone could die. I mean, the, we're, we're creating a society where everything is so cushioned for at least some subset or some um, socioeconomic group of children that they really aren't learning how to deal with injuries, you know. And then there's the psychological side where my son played basketball in a YMCA basketball league. His team won the championship. He got exactly the same trophy as every other team did because they didn't want anyone to feel bad. So, so he threw his trophy away because he recognized it at that point had no value. So I, I'll also point out that you've placed yourself in exactly that subversive category of people who are voiding warranties and accumulating potential criminal and, and civil uh, penalties through your activities. I'm not saying that you've done anything wrong. Bravo for, for breaking the system in, in the ways that you find to be appropriate. But uh, uh, there are more and more rules against the kind of behavior that you're describing. I didn't say anything, so don't hold it against me personally. <laughs> <laughs> but, but on the other hand, uh, I, I also read an undertone in what you just said. I, I put on my sociologist hat again, and I, I kind of uh, was feeling some vibes of feeling a little resentful of generational typecasting. And all I can say is, welcome to my world. Uh, because basically that's what I address, is the tendency to lump groups of people together and associate traits, often negative traits, with who they are at their life stage. So as a millennial, which you are, uh, you've seen a lot of negative uh, uh, presentations of your generation. When are you going to leave the basement? You know, when are you going to get a job? When are you going to grow up? Well, again, the same thing ha happens with uh, older demographics, and it's uh, happening with every other generation. The point is, is we have to uh, start addressing the underlying um, realities of who we are as people and avoid the temptations to typecast just because they outwardly appear to fit a certain sociological group. And that's what I think about and write about almost daily. Okay, so you had a, a question or did you want to add to this discussion? Yeah, I'm talking to you. So I'm going to repeat the question. Uh, the question is about the future of our humanity and our spiritual identity within the context of technology that can potentially um, cause to isolate us as individuals. Well, that's isolating them, the technology. <laughs> um, that's a big question. There are people writing and thinking about that that feel that our psychological growth as a spe species is ongoing, that we are becoming um, wiser and more holistic. I mean, Tom addressed that to tie it back to Tom about the volume of knowledge that people today have relative to what we had years ago. Uh, but another point is, is that technology, if you think about the developed world, I was talking a little bit with Will about that earlier, um, the developing world has jumped an entire technological leap. They don't have telephones, they have cell phones. What's going to happen is two billion people are going to come online in the next five years. And they're going to join the human conversation. And they're going to be bringing the wisdom of uh, other ways of looking at life, uh, other cultures that are not technologically bound, because sometimes we get arrogant as Westerners that we have the, the view of the way reality is supposed to be. But there's wisdom. We're losing uh, equivalent in, in your lifetime about 7,000 different cultures on this planet and their languages will die. And we'll, but when we can bring those people online with their conversation, and the wisdom that they bring from ancient traditions, suddenly that becomes part of the amalgam of who we are. I have a, a very different answer to that question, but in terms of spiritual growth, uh, this is uh, uh, perhaps even a, a crude and, and perhaps even perverse uh, answer to your question, but Tom uh, showed pictures of a device called the transcranial magnetic stimulator, which you can place on your head and either enhance or suppress the activity of different portions of the brain. 
This can be used to, uh, as, a, as a learning aid to quiet down the parts of your brain that interfere with learning. It can also be used, it is being used right now to treat depression and anxiety, other things like that. Another thing that it can be used for though is to increase activity in your right temporal lobe, which is where we experience spiritual and religious sensations. So uh, it, it's almost, I mean, you could think of it almost as a, a, a sort of a drug or, or masturbation of, of that region of your brain. So whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I'm not, I'm not weighing in on that specifically, but you can have tremendously powerful uh, spiritual experiences by placing a cap on your head and flipping an on switch. Let me add to that, too, on a different level. <laughs> <laughs> this is turnabout. This is totally turnabout. I, I, I will, uh, I will uh, we'll turn this over to Jeff, but to continue basically what Will was saying, uh, a few of us in here might have heard of a drug called psilocybin, magic muff mushrooms. Well, that's been isolated uh, by Johns Hopkins University, and there is evidence that there are certain types of people that cannot access spiritual experience as effectively as others. And they are using the uh, isolated compounds from psilocybin mushrooms to have people have an opportunity for a deep and profound spiritual experience, particularly at the end of life, during the hospice experience. And this is going to be growing in the, uh, the hospice pharmacy over the next 10 years where people will self-select and maybe family, family members. And what they've proven by research at Johns Hopkins is that people who had never taken psilocybin before, who had uh, allowed themselves to go through this process with a guide, by their own self-report, had one of the five most spiritual experiences of their lives, and that those spiritual experiences persisted for at least a year or two after the experience. And that's how far they are into the research. It might be for the rest of their lives if they should live much longer than a couple of years. So that's how the integration of technology uh, comes about in a different way. You, you can use uh, the, the online tools to, to find real groups of people that meet in the physical world. Uh, so the technology doesn't isolate or, or bring people together. It just enables whatever it is you're, you're trying to do. Uh, how many of you are aware of the TV show that Morgan Freeman um, is the MC of uh, Into the Wormhole? How many of you saw the one where um, they talked about spirituality among scientists? And back, I believe, in the 1950s, the majority of scientists of record were not religious and spiritually based. Today they are. That's an interesting, you know, finding in itself. So I'm not sure there's a lack of spirituality caused by any of the new sciences or the new technologies. Um, I, I'm very involved with the arts as well as the sciences. I've always been sort of schizophrenic. Uh, I like a good fight, but I, I'm schizophrenic, okay? <laughs> and I don't believe that the arts, in fact, if you take a look at uh, the arts that are taking place uh, in cinema and the film industry and even writing um, is, is continuing to expand our humanity uh, and ask huge questions, uh, the very important questions, I don't believe that's being stifled. I think we could transcend our own bodies and still maintain our humanity. Right, and on that, I know we have hit the end of our time. Thank you all very much for participating. Thank you three for being my victims. And we'll hope to see you at another event. <laughs>